So thank you for coming to this uh, Wildfire Preparedness Month event uh, together with the Estes Chamber and the Estes, Park, uh, Estes Valley Board of Realtors. Janine, you wanna say a few words about why uh, you were motivated to collaborate on this event? Sure. So one of the things that um, realtors do that a lot of people don't aren't aware of is that we really advocate for um, property owners' rights. And uh, one of the things that we think is important is knowing how to protect your property. So obviously, um, you know, wildfire is not new to Estes, but with it being so fresh in everyone's mind from last year, uh, we just felt like this was a great time to get this out front and center before people. Great, great. Well, we are grateful to have all of you here, grateful for our speakers who are willing to share information. And I wanted to, to start with Charlie Rayner um, with the National Park Service. We wanted to have a perspective on wildfire. That was something that came up last year during the fires in the evacuation. Um, a lot of conversation about, oh, how sad this is. And honestly, it's a natural product of living in the mountains. So Charlie, thank you for giving us a little bit of a, a, a cursory understanding of what it means to be a, a resident in the mountains and, and what role does fire play in the natural ecology of the forest? Yeah, sure. It's uh, it's very dynamic to say the least. It's, um, you know, and it is part of, part of where we live. Um, and, and, you know, I can touch upon some things, just to kind of the fire ecology, forest ecology. Um, but yeah, we, we're, we live with it. It's here and it's not going to go away. So, so yeah, I provide some information and then it's kind of hard to narrow it down to 10 minutes because it's such a dynamic topic and it's such, uh, you know, a popular topic today because we all went or through it last year, most likely, and yeah. uh, touched all of us in different ways. So. True, and that's why we're providing a, a perspective from many points of view, including just a residential perspective on um, how we were or were not prepared. And, um, you know, from, from your standpoint, um, we're curious to know, you know, what is it that, that you, if, you know, given 10 minutes to share with the general public, what would you like for the average resident to know about the role of wildfire in the forest. And I'm yeah, so, I mean, what's that? I'm gonna make you a co-host so that you can actually share any slides that you have. Okay, yeah, that'd probably be the best way to for me to kind of collect and uh, give you my thoughts in organized way. So yeah, let's do that. I, got, I have about eight slides. That means I have to keep it within one minute each slide. So I'm gonna kind of rip through okay, them, good. but, but uh, go I think it'll screen. Can you see that? I'm not seeing it yet. Okay, uh, let's see. Hey, got it? Yeah, we have it. Good. All right. So, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, like Donna said, my name is Charlie Raynar. I'm the Wildland Operations, uh, Fire Operations Specialist at Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, lived here in the community about nine years and uh, worked in this position for nine years. And uh, some say when I showed up is when the big fires happened. So I don't know what that means, but... <laughs> Uh, so a fire, you know, in general is a, is a, disturb a, a disturbance that occurs in the forest, uh, not unlike wind, you know, blowing over trees and things like that, you know, insects, disease, uh, and then, you know, there's human impacts. We all have impacts on the, the forest, but fire is just one of those impacts and disturbances, and it happens to be one of the, the best ways to provoke uh, change in the forest ecosystems and, and um you know, create a more dynamic, healthy environment, um, depending on the severity of the fire. But, you know, forests aren't a static environment. They're constantly changing. Um, and all of our forests are in some, some stage of recovery from prior disturbance, whether it be a, 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 a slide, uh, an avalanche, uh, wind, 
wind events, things like that. And then lightning is a natural event that causes fire to occur. So, um, and one can argue humans as well, uh, about 85 to 90% of our fires are started uh, by humans. Um, so just to keep that in mind. So I, I don't know if you can see that very well. Let me, how's that? Maybe a little better. So this is our fire history map. And we had some researchers come into the park a number of years ago and they actually went out and spent a ton of time uh, coring trees and then looking at those tree rings and then finding when, when and where fires occurred. And uh, this map, I don't know if you can see it too well, but there's some small on the Northwest part of the park, there's some small blue fires. And those fires actually dated back to the 13s and 1400s. And then the green areas are 15, 16, 1700s. The brown is uh, later 1700s, 1800s, up until uh, 2012 and 13. We had the Fern Lake fire in 2012. And of course, this map is missing last year's fires, but um, I'll put my cursor uh, over it. But, but basically, these troublesome uh, burned this area here and then into uh, east of the divide and through here again. So, so just showing that, you know, fire has been part of our landscape and part of our uh, area for a long time. And, you know, this is just Rocky Mountain National Park. The fires didn't stop at our boundary. Uh, if you could imagine, you know, all the forest land, forested lands around uh, the park as well has similar fire history. So, um, Looking at the different gradients, you know, if you go down to the valley, um, you know, east of here, um, you, you have the plains and then the foothills and then up to Estes Park. And each one of these uh, ecosystems, these, you know, areas of forested lands uh, and grasslands have what we call a fire regime. And these are the general fire characteristics that, that surround a, a chunk of land, basically. Um, th this is the frequency of fires that should or supposed to occur. Um, that would be, we call it the fire return interval. And then, you know, there's part of the regime is the intensity that a fire is supposed to burn in these areas, such as grasslands and up in the subalpine. And then, you know, the seasonality and extent of the fire. So that's how we characteristic, basically uh, characterize a chunk of ground and we call it the fire regime. And and each one of these will start, you know, Estes Park, we're pretty much in this montane area where you have ponderosa pine predominantly uh, with open grasslands and ponder ponderosa pine, dug fir up to uh, the lower elevations of lodgepole. But, but these areas are ponderosa pine forests. Um, they're very adapted to fire. Um, the, you know, you're looking at about 5,000 to 9,500 feet. Uh, so up, if you can think of like out to Moraine Park, a um, little bit beyond there. Now uh, these, these are really fire adapted ecosystems. There's, if you think of a ponderosa pine tree, they have really thick bark, really fire resistant. So um, what is supposed to happen is, you know, there should be a surface fire. You know, and I'm talking naturally, there would be a surface fire that would go through and, and these trees could withstand the fire. And, uh, they would just, the fire would just burn around it and without killing the bark and killing the bowl of the tree. So um, they also have really deep roots, which help um, if the surface is burned around a tree, they'll stay intact and they won't fall over after a fire goes through. And they're also self pruning. pruning. So if you look around of, of a, any of the trees that haven't been pruned by, by us, um, they, their lower branches die and then they fall off. And you know that keeps, the fire from going up into the crown of the tree and uh, essentially killing it. So those are just some of the adaptations of that lower montane uh, and upper montane ecosystems. And typically fires are supposed to return into that, those ecosystems every 30 to hundred years uh, is what researchers came up with. So fairly frequent fire return interval and the intensity and severity is, is mixed in these areas, it's supposed to be mixed. So you have a, a mosaic, um, a mosaic of fire severity where some trees have burned and, and died, others have withstood it and uh, more low intensity. So it creates more of a mosaic, which um, 
you know, it gives it different stand densities of trees and structure. So kind of mixed. So then moving up to the subalpine, you have our, our lodgepole forests and our spruce fir forests. And these, these are forests that are um, very easily killed by fire. Um, they basically from like 9,500 feet up to 11,500 feet, which is where the tundra starts. Um, you know, these trees have thin bark, especially the spruce and fir, uh, they have real thin bark. They're really resinous. So they're, you know, they're, um, they're pretty flammable, like they're sap and then they're shallow rooted. So if a fire goes through, um, it's going to damage their roots if it's, you know, any sort of intensity and their crowns of the trees are low to the ground. So, um, that enables them to, um, that enables fire to go up into the grounds and, and kill the top of the tree. So, and their foliage, if you think of your Christmas trees uh, after, you know, in January, and if you think about making a campfire in the wood, in the woods, and you see uh, these spruce fir trees, that these are those real short needles, and they're often turn red when they die, but they're great fire starters. So you can think of that as being um, easily killed. The, Fire return intervals in these areas, you're, you're talking pretty long time, 300 years plus. And typically fires are supposed to be really intense, high severity events in the spruce and fir. And then the lodgepole forest where a lot of us live, maybe up at Allen's Park or, you know, starting at about 7,500 feet up to 10,500 feet or so. Um, these are trees that are very much adapted to fire. Um, lodgepole pine trees have serotonous cones, so they need intense heat to, um, to germinate, to basically pop their seeds out and germinate and create new trees, which are really fast growing. Um, I don't know if anyone's been up to Yellowstone, so there's many fires, large fires up there in 1988, and you could go up there now, so what is that, 30 years later, and see um, 20, 30 foot uh, lodgepole pine trees. So they grew up really fast. Um, long fire return intervals. So hundred or plus years, uh, in these lodgepole stands. And again, high, high intensity, high severity fires are, you know, supposed to occur naturally. Um, all these lodgepole stands in our park have originated following fires, uh, in the last 400 years. So any lodgepole stand you see on the east or west side, of the park is uh, 400 years or younger. So looking at, uh, here's a historic photo from Bear Lake and you can see 1916, you can see some dead trees up there and a, and a fire occurred at some point prior to that. Uh, and then you can see a photo from 1986, probably could have got one a little more recent, but uh, it's more of what it looks like now, but um, just, just evidence that uh, fire has occurred here for a long, long time. And uh, when you're walking around the woods, you can see you can see evidence of fire in a lot of places if you look closely enough. So this is, Donna uh, sort of prompted this question and it's a great one. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's a real hot topic and not, no pun intended there, but uh, is fire good or bad? And, and uh, you know, how I can answer that is, you know, I believe it's it's good when uh, it's restoring for us and it's uh, creating ecosystem health. But when it comes near communities and it comes near our infrastructure and it becomes destructive, that's that's when it's bad. So that this is the problem we have, and this is what we have to think about and plan for in the future, um, because we are seeing more and more um, high severity fires. Uh, and our fire seasons are lasting longer. Uh, in some places, they're pretty much year round in California now, whereas in the past, uh, when I first started my career and 20 years ago, um, you had your fire season. It was basically April 1st until September 30th or so, uh, give or take. But now we're, we're having more and more fires in the winter. So these are things we need to plan for as uh, land managers, homeowners, uh, et cetera. So I got to move our photos here so I could read my text, but um, yeah, mother nature built our forests to burn. Um, 
in a lot of different ways. And here in Estes Park, we have uh, frequent 50 to 7 mile an hour Chinook, which is warm uh, and downsloping winds. We all are familiar with the winds here. And then we have all these drainages that funnel into the community and the winds funnel in, into there. So that's another problem. Plus continuous fuels and extreme unpredictable fire behavior if they do start. So um, these are things that you know we all need to think about and, uh, and plan and prepare for. So I know that was pretty quick, but. Uh, That's, it's perfect questions. because I think it's a good place to ask what questions uh, people might have. I know when you said that fires have a tendency to recur, return every 30 to 100 years. My first thought as a resident in Estes Valley is, does that mean that we're good for another 30 years? I mean, what are the possibilities that we'll see another fire um, anytime soon? Yeah, I mean, that 30 to 100 years is is for that particular chunk of ground. So, you know, and not everything burned here. You know, we have some areas that burned, um, I forget how many thousand acres in the, on the east side of the park, but like 17,000 acres on the west side of the park. But, you know, if you look around, um, just in Essex Park, there's a lot of unburned forest. So that's a tough question to to answer, but I can say there will be there will be more fires. Right now, we're we're uh, just came out of drought on the east side of the divide and the northern front range, so that's good news. Um, but the west side of the park and Grand Lake and that area is still in moderate drought, and it gets drier as further west you go. So, yeah, by any means, um, we're not out of the we're not out of the woods. Yeah. Well, and I think it's good. This is why we're doing this education to be ready. Um, so we're not taken by surprise. You mentioned that fire seasons are now year round in many parts of the country. What has changed that has resulted in that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you can ignore climate change. Um, you know, it's our, you know, the, the, the oceans are becoming warmer. We're seeing hotter temperatures. Temperatures have gone up, our mean average temperatures have gone up. Um, and then uh, drought, drought has become way more prevalent and that's a huge factor when it comes to wildland fire. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, you can't ignore climate change. I, you know, that's what my personal feeling is, but um, we're also a blurb of time um, here and there has been climate change in the past, but um, I think it's a combination of a lot of different things. Yeah. You know, our rising temperatures, there's different oceanic patterns now. Um, the El Nino, uh, La Nina effects, things like that are lasting longer. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a combination of a lot. And plus, communities are, you know, we're building our homes closer to these areas that burn too. So it's becoming more of an issue. Yeah. It's a really good point. Well, on that point, I want to just toss it back to the audience to ask if you have any other questions for Charlie relative to his presentation. Okay, uh, Charlie, would you go ahead and give us the screen back and um, hit stop share? Yep. And, um, I wanted to to take this chance to ask Susan Faraday to talk about some of the trends in insurance with regard to what you just said, Charlie, about communities building houses closer and closer to wildfire areas. All right, and um, I was, I had one question, sorry, Charlie, before I get started, I was trying to unmute my, my screen when um, I wasn't quick enough. Um, but you guys still have the philosophy that you're not going to stop fires when they're burning, right? Unless they're coming close. I mean, is that still? <clears throat> that's that's actually not fire. our philosophy. We so we manage oh, okay. every. Good thing I that up. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. Um, yeah. yeah, that you know our philosophy, our our management objectives for every fire are pretty much the same. You know, and that's protect people, life, safety and then protect communities and infrastructure. And then 
um, you know, if we can do those things, then it would be to, you know, restore or use fire to, um, for ecological benefits. But um, no, no, our, the, the park very much. So our objectives first start to protect people and communities. And every fire is managed that way. We do it. We have different tactics. I would figure that, yeah. Yeah, we have different tactics, but but yeah, if we can't do those two things, we can't reap the benefits of ecological, uh, you know, fire for the good of the ecology. Yeah. It's a good. Thank you. Great. Right. So insurance and okay. Go oh, go ahead. No, it's yours. Okay. Should I go ahead? Yes. Mine. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, insurance is kind of a big deal. Um, you know, we there. There's a couple of things. You know, we're noticing in the um, in the industry is like some carriers are just getting away from doing any homes up in the mountain areas because it's just, you know, I think with global warming and everything that's going on, it's becoming such a risk, and people are building closer. So I um, to the mountains trying to get away. So I'm just going to kind of go through what I know as some basic things about um, if you're. Um, you know, if you're building or you're selling a home or, you know, what are insurance companies really looking for? So for existing homes, you know, they really want to, if they're coming out and they're going to look at the home, whether or not you're going to insure it, is, you know, the pine needles clearing the area of debris, you know, um, firewood needs to be 30 feet. An insurance company really looks a lot at the 30 feet around a house. Um, some companies will, uh, which I know you guys are going to get into, is firewise. Some of them will adopt zone one. Some of them adopt zone two, which extends, you know, right around the house. Zone one is pretty much clear cut everything for 30 feet. Some companies will, um, you know, say they're fine as long as trees are a distance away. That um, if they're not naturally built up, then we need to naturally. I mean, then they need to to be up off the ground about you know, six to eight feet. Um, things cannot be touching the roof. Insurance companies are getting away from anything with wood, wood shake shingles. That's just kind of out there. Um, so pretty much, you know, we look at anything where a fire, I can remember there was a house in Glen Haven that we tried to insure and it was kind of built up and the house, you know, had, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm at my grandkids' house and, and the, that phone's going up, so I apologize, but, um, Anyways, um, you know, if the fire can come up under the ground and get up under the house, so decks, they're wanting decks enclosed, eaves enclosed, if at all possible. Um, but they look at things of even as how accessible is your home? They're, they're wanting so a fire truck can come both directions, you know, and if you can't come up both directions, are there a number of pullouts? So that a fire truck can get in there. Some people are putting in cisterns. You know, I've insured some homes where people have put in some cisterns so that there's a nice supply of water right there. Um, but it is getting harder to insure. Their insurance companies like to see two access roads, one in and out, so that you know there's another option. We still have some places that basically have one, and so far we've been able to insure up in that area, that would be the Little Valley area. Um, but I think as we have more and more fires, you know, we're gonna see higher rate increases and we're gonna see more strict, um, you know, regulations as far as in monitoring. Some insurance companies are going out every two to three years to making sure that a home, but you know, most of it's cleaning up the pine needles, raking things, um, you know, fire resistive, um, oh gosh, I'm losing my word, you know, on the, on your um, pipe coming up through the house. That's like a big thing. I mean, we'll cancel people really quick there, but um, they're just looking at those things. And I know for the realtors, it's like having that conversation with people up front is critical because, um, you know, you, you want to make sure it's insurable. There are still a couple of companies right now that um, if your major insurance is like Farmers, Allstate, American Family, State Farm, if they won't insure it, there is still um, about two companies that will insure anything, but at a high, high, high price. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's just, what can you do? I mean, it's, it's, 
you know, not having anything close to the house, the junipers, we love the junipers because of the, the birds are just, they're wonderful in the birds, but you know, that's like kerosene. You've just got to move it. You know, it's got to be away from the house, nothing touching. Um, and it is funny, each insurer has different regulations. I mean, one insurer will be, they, they won't touch anything in Estes Park and other insurance will touch it, but but then they want, you know, they don't want the trees touching together. They want the trees apart, They nothing on the roof. It's just more of a thing that I, you know, we saw it up in the, not the Woodland Heights, but I saw it up in the, the at the Risk Canyon fire. You know, we had homes that had the concrete siding and had done really good mitigation. And it came through and got the garage and didn't hit two of the homes. You know, so there are definite things of fire mitigation. Now, the big thing that some insurers do, and I know my company does, is we now have um, contracted with a wildfire um, team that will come out and help. They are not nearly as good as our our Glen Haven and our Estes Park Fire Department were amazing. They were they were foam and houses, but but they do go up there and assist. If the fire department will let them there, they will go to your home and try to, to mitigate as much as they can to stop, you know, if your home is in the line of fire. So there are quite a few insurance companies doing that now. And, and I believe that, um, I mean, I couldn't believe with this last fire that I didn't lose, you know, 100 homes. <laughs> I, was, I was in shock that we didn't, but most of it was, I mean, some of the homes were foamed and, and mitigated nicely and that, that's what did it. But, you know, so just kind of remember for there's, you know, a couple of things, clear any debris away from the house, absolutely clear. Make sure nothing is touching the roof and that all the pine needles are cleaned out of the gutters. That's critical. All of your, um, your firewood's gotta be 30 feet away. You know, keeping any vehicle or anything that can be combustible you know, away from the house, like old vehicles, old stuff, just, you know, keep that and clear that away from the house and, and, and not having a lot of, um, like one of the big things is the bark. They said, remove all of that bark, put concrete or, or just something that isn't combustible, you know, rocks, rocks are a real good mitigation um, piece, but it works because we've had, we had a lot of homes saved, especially in this last fire. So, and that's why we but, um, invited some of the residents to actually tell stories about um, uh, about their homes being saved, and we uh, have a few pictures coming up with more information on fire mitigation techniques. And that's the reason why we're having the walk and talk tomorrow um, yeah. to to point out some areas of of alarm. And uh, I know that there are. Um, landscaping companies that specialize in helping you to create landscaping without um, sending your fire insurance rates up <laughs> with your insurance coverage. So thank you so much for- Donna, may I add something there as well? Yes, I can't see who's speaking, but- This is Tony from Summit. Yeah, Tony, yeah, you're, yeah, you're gonna be on in a few minutes, but sure, go ahead and- Okay, oh, wonderful. Oh, I just have one other thing that I probably like to end saying, you know, when, when this first started, you know, and the companies were really looking at um, insurance companies, you know, people would say, that's why I moved here, is I want these trees right here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it used to be kind of like there would be an option, maybe they could find somebody that would do it. I think that's in the past. I think that insurance companies are going to be much more aware of what they're insuring and where they're insuring it and how active those people are in mitigating, you know, to help the losses. And so, you know, I think we're moved into a new period of time when everybody has to be conscientious about what's going on. Yeah, I think we've, we've lived it. We're going to hear a few other stories, but I wanted to thank you, Susan, and, and just remind everybody to check with your own insurance company because the, the policies just vary and it's great to get a list from your insurance provider on what's required there. But um, the middle school has done a significant amount of research and Jenny is going to introduce our guests from the middle school to talk about the work that they've done for the community. Yeah, so the Essence Park uh, Middle School participated in uh, what's called the RISE program. Uh, this 
just this past uh, couple weeks ago, um, they had a competition that was statewide. Um, really impressive. Uh, they had to do a lot of research into um, what, their, what their project was, was mitigation. So um, Steve Johnson is uh, their, the teacher from uh, Essence Park Middle School who was working with the kids. And so we're going to turn it over to them and, and see exactly what they've prepared. Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. Thumbs up, I guess. <laughs> uh, I have Abby Watry with me. She's one of our sixth grade students and a real superstar with the team here. Um, just briefly, uh, what we decided to do was uh, the challenge came out from a group called Earth Force and from FEMA to deal with a project that has something to do with natural hazards. And of course, we've all been evacuated this last year. And so fire seemed the obvious choice for us. And um, the students decided that uh, with COVID restrictions that the best thing that we could do would be to work on our own family's homes and see if we could get uh, people in our middle school community to get out and, and do a lot of the FireWise recommendations in their own homes. Um, following that, we also had two thoughts that uh, were part of our second and third phase to the program, I guess. One was to, um, contact a homeowners association and just provide a short video of what our kids had done and say, you know, encourage your families to do something along the same lines. And the second thing was uh, kind of along the lines that uh, both Charlie and Susan alluded to earlier with uh, um, we would like to see the town change some of the landscape policies because there's encouragement for things like uh, juniper trees close to the home and stuff like that. And also to put up some kind of warning signs similar to what we have in the canyon that says, in case of a flash flood, climb to safety. If you're going in a road that goes into a uh, public area for hiking or something like that, and it's the only way in and out, that there would be some kind of warning sign there that says, this is the only way in and out of this road, please be careful with fire, so that they knew that they weren't getting trapped up there. I'm going to let um, Abby tell you a little bit about her experience as a student. Well, I felt like Earth Force, first of all, was pretty fun. We met once or twice a week to talk about our slides that we would then give to the judges for the first part. And then we, after they would do those, we would fix them up a bit and then resend them in. We ended up getting second place, but I felt like it was pretty fun to just be in the contest. We made sure that we weren't the judges. We had some judges from the town and other people. We also did a lot of interviews to get information and perspectives. And everyone sounded like they were in agreement with what we had to say. We also got a lot of facts from people. Um, then we went into the contest and we won second place. So that was really exciting. But also our eighth grade got called back in and I think they got third place. Mm -hmm. So it was just overall pretty exciting, but it also helped with my public speaking skills and just speaking to people that I don't really know and just getting used to that. I think one of the things we came away from it with was it was difficult to get kids to get out and do the work. But one thing we recognized too is that a lot of kids understand the importance of it. So even if they didn't do the work, during our contest period, which we had two or three snowstorms during that. So it's kind of hard to get out and rake the needles and pick up the pine cones when there's snow on the ground. But a lot of kids at least recognize the need for both uh, the fire mitigation in their yards. And if they're renting or maybe in a condominium or something like that, having an evacuation kit ready to go um, so that they could get out quickly and not have to take time to figure out what do we need and what should we uh, leave behind. So. I think that was a, a great learning experience for all of us. Fantastic. And thanks for your service to the community. That's amazing. Um, the contribution that you made and the education that you've provided. And we're really grateful to have that. Hopefully we can continue to partner on education. I hope so. Yeah. Thank you. On the, on the resident side, in terms of the experience for residents, I know one of our speakers couldn't make it today. Harriet Liz in the Glenhaven area. And um, when she came back after the evacuation, she said you could see a clear line where the, the firefighters had dug a trench and protected their property. And it was kind of eerie to think how close the fire came and that you could really see 
where it stopped and it shows why we mitigate the way that we do. Lori Smith is on the call today to talk us uh, talk to us a little bit about um, the retreat and some of her experience with the fire last year. Hi there. So I'm out in the retreat. I've been out there a couple of years. I lived in Estes since 05 and I've really never had a any kind of a significant fire event experience. And so uh, being out there, I don't really know what to expect. Uh, I think my situation is probably similar to a lot of people's. Um, it just came down to, uh, you know, planning and communication. Uh, so we were evacuated a little bit before I think you were in Estes. Uh, it was mid-October. We were evacuated and we were in voluntary evacuation, I think, starting in Labor Day. And so there was a big push uh, to do a lot of fire mitigation. And and I work in the real estate market, and we counsel our clients about fire mitigation. You evaluate properties. Uh, but it's a lot different when it's, you know, when it's happening uh, right then. And they're, you know, encouraging you to do a lot of work uh, on your property. I was pretty lucky I'm on Dunraven Glade and so the fire didn't come very far down Dunraven Glade uh, but it was uh, the fire department was great there I mean I think there was just a lot of education uh, about mitigating your property how to get it ready before you move I think in my mind I had this vision of you know a big pump truck in front of my house if my house got on fire and you're you know, watching them, you know, save homes, but uh, the reality for wildland firefighting was a lot different. So I really learned a lot through that and, and what Harriet's talking about uh, in that neighborhood. If, you, if you're curious about fire mitigation or you just need ideas and want to see the value of it, I'd really just encourage you to drive, uh, drive out Dunraven Glade, drive up in the back part of the retreat because you can look at properties and see clearly this property was saved because of the fire mitigation that they did. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing the difference that it makes. So uh, definitely, definitely do that. It's very educational. Uh, I know for me as a resident, it, I mean, I feel like we all kind of had a this traumatic experience, but what makes it better is you know the education aspect, um, planning, sitting down with your family, uh, making a plan of what to take, like what Steve was talking about, having an evacuation kit, uh, and also doing inventory. Susan is so wonderful. I just have to give a plug for her. She called uh, uh, to check on me and how we were doing, and through all of that when we were evacuated and. Uh, making sure that, you know, you have enough insurance coverage and those kinds of things. And uh, we had an app on our phone that we could take pictures and do inventory. So, uh, so those kinds of things just made it, made it so much better. The uh, Glenhaven Fire Department was really great with their communication. So I think what saved me is just getting plugged in with my neighbors and getting plugged in with the all the ways that they can communicate with you. Larimer County was great. The fire department was great. And uh, I'm not sure how my, what I can add here that might be helpful, but just planning beforehand. We were involuntary for so long. I mean, there's really no excuse for us not to be ready in October when they finally pulled the trigger and the call came for us to leave. Uh, so when you go into involuntary, into the involuntary, you know, get your ducks in a row, get a play with your family to get your things out, get your vehicles out, have your car ready, ready to go and, and have everybody's contact number. It was, you know, there's so many second homes out there. It's really great to check in with your neighbors and find out what they need. And if they're going to be at their property, if there's something you can do uh, to help them out. So, cause it's a really, I'm probably, a third of the residents or second home residents in that area. So, which I mean, Estes too has that same issue, so. Lori, in terms of um, preparation for evacuation and having that plan in advance, what did you learn from last year's evacuation that have uh, has influenced the plan that you have 
for this year? Uh, you kind of realize that you really don't need that much stuff <laughs> if you're going to leave. We started filling up a lot of our vehicles and, you know, I think you just, uh, it's, it's important papers and I mean, all those, all those kind of things, you're getting your medical papers, you're getting your insurance paper, those kind of just forces you to get organized. And, uh, I have adult children who are living at home, working and going to school. And so, you know, it's just, you know, who's going to be there, what car is going to be there, knowing that you had some people that you could call that could be dropped off to drive out a vehicle or a trailer, things like that. So just getting those important documents. Uh, at that point, when the fire is that close to your house, you know, that stuff doesn't matter. You're just worried about personal safety and, you know, checking with your neighbors and making sure that they can get out safety, safely. So those kinds of things. So. Right. I, we heard some funny stories on Facebook when people were able to conjure a, a sense of humor about remembering the dogs who were forgetting their toothbrush or their contact lenses. Mm -hmm. and the kind yep. of list that our family has started to make since we experienced an, an evacuation years ago in a different part of the state. My husband filled the car with guns and fishing rods and I filled my car <laughs> with all of our computers and all of our kids artwork. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. One of the things that yep. I learned is that I don't need to keep six tubs of my kids' artwork. So as I took it out of the car, I took pictures of every piece and then I threw it away and kept the, the pictures as my memory. So it, it, it definitely helped us to think, what will we do different next time and how will we make our list? So I think mm -hmm. it's important to note there um, the personal aspects of being prepared. And um, thankfully, we have some really good um, guidelines online that we're going to share with you afterwards so you have some checklists and if you come tomorrow to the walk and talk with Tony with Summit Forestry then you're going to get a lot more information and we're going to hand you some some good materials that you can take home and share with your neighbors and on that point I want to hand it to Tony because I know you have some really good information to share as well as before and after pictures I think if I recall correctly do you want me to make you a host so you can share your slides I am having some technical difficulties on the slide side, okay. um, which is not uncommon at the office here in Estes. <laughs> um, and so I'm just going to I'm just going to share a few things and and won't take up much time today. Um, wanted to thank Charlie and certainly wanted to, um, to thank Susan as well. Um, you know, we're working in those in those same areas. And I think one of the things that that we bring to the table with our experience is just kind of helping folks walk through that process. Sometimes the defensible space work is very obvious. It's tree work and heavy shrub work. Um, sometimes it is pine needles and pine cones. But a lot of times when we're out doing that cutting and that work, you know, we're cutting out landscaping that was put in 30 or 40 years ago that the house was designed around and trying to kind of help folks find that transition. So that as we're putting things back together, even though we may not be speaking to your insurance agent now, we want to do it in a way that if we're speaking to them in five years, you know, we've taken the corrective steps to replace a lot of that flammable fuel with less flammable things and, you know, more stone, less density and finding folks, finding the right plan for folks to do that and keep it looking natural. Um, and it's just something that I think that we just have a lot of trepidation still there around cutting trees. Um, sometimes that primary defensible space is really a lot of raking in pine needles and cleanup, um, as, uh, as Susan had said, and sometimes it's more extensive tree cutting, but I think uh, trying to find uh, that balance between what the fire department is looking for, what your insurance agent is looking for, and what you're looking to keep as a homeowner uh, to keep that yard personal and forested and beautiful um, is where we can come in and lend a little experience as well. Good, good. Well, I really appreciate the fact that you are willing to take us on a little walk tomorrow. Um, starting at Bond Park, we're going to take a little walk just in the downtown corridor where Tony can point out very specifically some areas that could um, are very well um, prepared and some that you know, opportunities for improvement. And I love, Lori, that you suggested driving around and seeing what has happened um, you know, during the fires last year, people can really see a good example. I know we have 
bark around our house and it makes me wonder, hmm, I wonder who designed that. <laughs> it's good to know that that may not be the best idea. So I hope you all can join us tomorrow with Tony downtown. We're all go also going to have um, a visitor, Valcor Roofing. We'll talk about fire retardant roofs during the walk and talk as well. And on that note, we're going to have some really great materials that the um, Estes Valley Fire District has um, provided for us. We'll be passing that out tomorrow, but I wanted to hand the platform to Mike Richardson to talk about. You have a cross-section of the community on the call, and this is going to get shared with the uh, Board of Realtors and the Chamber and on our public page. So, Mike, uh, what is it that you would like the community to know this year to be prepared for fire season? Uh, well, I, I think we all got a rude awakening last year to exactly what wildfire is, what it means, uh, awful close to home. I, I think we were really lucky. The uh, weather changed and that, that the uh, fire didn't enter town, which it was awfully close to do, doing. Uh, I will give a quick shout out to Susan with State Farm. She was quite helpful with my house. Uh, which was in the line of the fire, and uh, we called in and, and actually spoke about how how that looked from an insurance point. Because uh, while I was sitting in the command center watching the fire move towards town, uh, it was coming right at my house. So uh, really, really kind of hit home, you know. And then to have friends like Lori, who was you know displaced from her house for so long, and and uh, thankfully her house is still there. It's, it's pretty special. Uh, from a fire department perspective, just like to say that everybody should have these on hand. We have these at the firehouse. Uh, I think all the realtors have these. Uh, they're in the title companies and the, the action plans that are involved in this, uh, you know, it, it's just very well done. Uh, I, I can't say that I had much to do with it, but I am helping disperse it. So anyway, um, pretty much the people need to realize that the fire department is there to help as far as, as looking at your property to see what, what needs to be done. I think a lot of us know what needs to be done. It's, it's what it seems like it's not rocket science to break the needles, take the trees away from the house, but there's a little more to that. And, and I also think, uh, Lori also kind of said this, you know, it's about life safety. Uh, we don't want to lose property, but the main thing is that everybody gets out alive. Uh, that includes fire personnel, that includes, uh, you know, residents. So the, the whole action plan, the get ready, uh, get ready, have, your, have your, uh, uh, your go kits ready, have an action plan and, and, and practice it. No know which way to go, know, know how to get out of town, uh, you know, cooperate with local authorities when and if that day comes where you have to evacuate. Uh, with that being said, I think the evacuation went really well. Uh, hard to believe we got that many people out of town in that short of period of time, but it, it, it was done and uh, there was no loss of life. And luckily, we didn't lose that many structures. Uh, as far as the actual work, people like Tony, uh, any local tree companies can help with that. And, and uh, once you ascertain what needs to be done, then you contact someone to help if you can't do it yourself. Uh, the number at the firehouse is 970-577-0900. And also the website is estesvalleyfire.org. So uh, keep keep those handy. And if anyone needs any help, we're, we're more than happy to, to assist with with uh, figuring out what, what needs to be done. Super and I, rather than say the same things that everybody else said, I'll, I'll just kind of leave it at that. <laughs> Appreciate it. And I just want you to know, we're going to send a confirmation to everyone who registered for this forum with a link to the Estes Valley Fire Prevention page and their wildfire information page. And that, um, that kit that uh, Mike just held up is exactly one of the, the things that we're going to be passing out tomorrow at Bond Park. So um, yes, very, very educational. Any other um, questions? What have we not touched on? What have we not touched on?
Well, I take that as a sign that we've done a really comprehensive job of covering the basics. Donna, I could just add something. Um, I'm a huge advocate for, you know, firewise and, and fuels treatments. I've seen a lot of homes saved because of just, you know, just a little bit of work done around people's houses. And, um, you know, there's three things that you need to, to have fire and that's heat, oxygen, and fuel. And we can't do anything about the weather and the temperatures. We can't do anything about oxygen. <laughs> uh, fuel isn't the only thing we can really do something about uh, and in a, in a grand scheme of things. So yeah, I just wanted to put that in there. It's really good to remember. I like short lists, heat, oxygen, and fuel. <laughs> The only one we can really control is fuel. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you very much for everyone's participation. Janine, any final words for our group? I'd just love to have everybody come out tomorrow. If you want to stop by Bond Park, um, like I said, we'll have um, We'll have the fire district handouts. Uh, we'll also have information for the sort yard. And um, right now the fire department does not have someone on staff um, that does the property assessments, but we're going to, if you're interested in having that done, we're still gonna collect that information. Um, they are looking to replace that person. So um, if you if you wanna have some assessment done on property, we we would love to get you signed up for that. Good deal. Well, I hope to see you all tomorrow at 10 a.m. at Bond Park. Look for Janine and me and Brian um, in the middle of the park. Um, you'll see a small crowd forming. Tony will be there as well as Valcor Rufi. Uh, I will Mary, put Mary Murphy and Mike Richardson will also. Oh, good, good. Yay, thank you. Good to meet you in person. Well, I will follow up with a, a link to the recording. Um, in an email and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody.